Those of you wouldn't open up to Luke 18. Luke 18, continuing our study on the Word of Prayer. I'm, I'm going I'm to be reading several texts tonight. And, uh, you know, if you want to follow along, uh, please do so. If, if you just want to listen, uh, that'd be fine also. But I think, it, you know, we, when we started this a, a few weeks ago, we talked about Bible study. And Bible study, I believe, is reading the Bible. And I believe it's important for us to open the Bible and, and compare Scripture with Scripture. And, and also prayer, prayer meeting, the importance of prayer. And so that's what we're talking about. And tonight, we're talking about the necessity of humility. You know, one of the things that hinders prayer, that it will hinder our prayer life more than anything, is pride. You know, we, we get this prideful spirit, and, and it, it has a, an effect on our prayer life. It's like we don't recognize God for who He is. We, the, it seems like the, the less... We, we need God the less our, our prayers. We, we don't need God right now, but when you're out of work, when you have a, a terminal illness, when things are just going wrong, then you need God. You get closer to God, and, and, and you get that, that humble spirit. But when things are going well, the pride just kind of sets in. It reminds me of a story in World War, or no, actually the Civil War. And uh, I don't know if any of you all other than Brother Galloway were around back during the Civil War, but there was a Union general by the name of John Sedgwick, and John Sedgwick was inspecting his troops, and uh, they're on the battlefield, and as he was walking around, they had this, what they call a parapet. Anybody know what a parapet is? It's like a small wall, and, and, and it was stretched around either a roof or... Okay, now you can hear me. Okay. Well, uh, I'm not going to start over. So, but open up your Bibles if you are in, in Luke. And let me just real quick, we talked about uh, in our first lesson, calling upon the name of the Lord, which was really the start of prayer. I mean, that's where it all begins in confession of sin. That's where salvation begins. Call upon the name of the Lord. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But it's more than that. Calling upon the name of the Lord is a daily mark of the Christian. It's walking and talking and, and learning and listening from God. It becomes, we become dependent upon Him every moment of our, of our lives. And that's calling upon the Lord. It's not just a one-time experience. It's, it's a trait that continues throughout our life. And then in the second lesson, we talked about knowing and loving the Father, which is the heart of prayer. And it's more than just knowing facts about God the Father. It's knowing Him in a personal way. And we talked about the more that we learn to know Him and the more that we love Him, the more that we call upon Him. And the more that we call upon Him, the more that we get to know Him and, and love Him. And it's a continual cycle. And then tonight we're going to be talking about these spiritual battles that come into our lives. The, the, this, the, the need for humility, to recognize God. For who he is. When we come to the Lord in prayer, do we realize who we're coming before? Who we're calling upon? We're talking about the God of the universe. And I think sometimes we, we fail to remember that. It's not like we're just, you know, talking into thin air. We're addressing our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. The root of most spiritual attacks in our prayer life is self-centeredness and, and pride. And Satan knows that. Satan knows the way to get to you is through pride. No, no, you know, it, we all have problems with pride. It reminds me of the really a successful salesman. They asked him how, how he was so successful. He says, well, I always 
I always start off with the same line. I always say, hey, I want to show you something that your neighbors don't think that you could afford to buy. <laughs> and that gets them right away. They say, what do you mean my neighbors that don't think I can afford to buy this? I can afford to buy this. And he was very successful because he, he built upon their, he played against their pride. And so that's the way it works. And so we're going to be looking at this uh, tonight. And, and, and these are some of the things. Let me just mention these things quickly. Some of the things that will hinder an effective prayer life. First of all, when we focus on ourselves rather than God. You know, and whenever we come to prayer, when, when you go to prayer, is everything about you? Because that's not what prayer is about. It's coming and recognizing God and, and worshiping God in prayer. And praising him for what he's done. And being thankful to him. And asking him to forgive us where we failed him. It's about him. It's not about us. And focusing on ourselves will hinder effective prayer. Also, focusing on other people. Now, that can be positive or negative. You know, if we focus on other people about how, how, uh, how bad they are. Or, or, or trying to exalt other people in prayer. Rather than exalting God. That will hinder our, our spiritual uh, our prayer life as well. If we focus on circumstances. Instead of the God who controls the circumstances, that will hinder our prayer life. Our, our prayer life will become ineffect, uh, ineffective. And then one that I think a lot of us probably struggle with is when we focus on our requests. <laughs> it's all about asking. We just focus on our, our requests instead of focusing on the God that can meet those requests. It should be about him and not about us. And there's two common elements here in, in all these things that hinder prayer. One is the absence of true humility, and the other is the presence of pride. And we're going to see this here in Luke chapter 18 and beginning at verse number 9. Let's have a word of prayer, and we'll get started. Father Lord, I pray that you would bless in, uh, this uh, lesson tonight. Father Lord, help us to realize how sacred prayer is. Father Lord, how personal it is. And Lord... Uh, the proper way of prayer and it has to do with uh, us coming in a spirit of humility before you before the throne and lord help us to take any self-centeredness and pride out of the equation and lord just come and focus on you whenever we come and before you in prayer in jesus name we pray amen so here in luke chapter 18 in verse number uh, nine the Lord Jesus speaking here, he says, And he spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. So who's he talking to? He's talking to those that had a problem with pride. They trusted in themselves that they were righteous. That word trusted means that they were, they were fully persuaded or they, they were convinced beyond any reasonable doubt that uh, they were self-righteous. And, and their self-righteousness came from arrogance. It came from pride. And so this is who Jesus, this parable, was addressing. Uh, the, uh, I mean, he, he's, a, he's speaking this parable to these people that had this problem with pride. In verse number 18, he's, I mean, in verse number 10, he says, Two men went up to the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. And the Pharisee stood, now look at this, the Pharisee stood and he prayed thus with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice a week, and I give tithes of all that I possess. So what is this Pharisee? Now, you know, he went to the temple to pray. That's good that he went to the temple to pray. But where was his focus? His focus was on himself. He focused on himself and not on God. He, who was he thinking of? He wasn't thinking of God. He was thinking about himself. As a matter of fact, he wasn't thanking God. He was thanking himself. He was thanking God for himself. He was comparing himself with others. He was exalting himself above others. Uh, that, he, that he fasts and he, and he gives tithes. He wasn't exalting God. And he wasn't comparing himself with just anyone, was he? Look who he compared himself with. With, in verse number 11, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even this publican. Well, that's, that's a, a sign of somebody that has a problem with pride. They're going to try to compare themselves with somebody they know it's going to be easy to make them look good. Well, who should we be comparing ourselves with? 
We should be comparing ourselves with a holy God. I want to read here. If you want to turn there, fine. I'm going to read from Isaiah 5. But I'm just going to uh, touch on a few verses here in, in, verse five, in uh, chapter 5 and chapter 6. Isaiah, I think he had a problem with this. He needed God to deal with him and to, to bring him into a spirit of humility. As he was looking at all the sin of the, of the people there, as, as he spoke to them in, in, in chapter number 5, uh, he said this. Let me get there. He said in uh, verse number 8, Woe unto them that join house to house, that lay field to field. In verse number 11, Woe to them that rise up early in the morning that they may follow strong drink. Down in verse number 18, Woe unto them that draw iniquity with cords and vanity. In verse 20, Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil and put darkness for light. Look, verse, 20, uh, verse 21, Woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes. Verse 22, Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine and men of strength to, to mingle strong drink. Everything was woe unto them. Woe unto them. Boy, he's compared himself to them, and he looked pretty good, didn't he? But then he got a glimpse of the king on the throne. Chapter number 6. In the year of King Uzziah, uh, in, the king, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And, 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 and uh, look down at verse number 5. After he saw the Lord God and his holiness, he says, Then said I, Woe. Not woe is them. Woe is me. I am undone because I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. See, don't compare ourselves with other people. Compare ourselves with perfection, with the one that never sinned. And when we do that, we can see our faults and realize our need for humility. And so the Pharisee there, he was comparing himself with others. And then verse number 13, on the other hand, the publican, look at him. The publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes into heaven, but he smote upon his breast saying, God, be merciful unto me, a sinner. So, you know, how can we overcome this problem with pride? Number one, by admitting that we have a need. We have to admit that we have a need. Number two, we need to acknowledge that we ourselves cannot meet that need. And number three, we have to agree that God can meet that need. And number four, we need to ask God to meet that need. And then number five, we just need to anticipate that God is going to answer that request in his way and in his timing. So it's all about admitting, acknowledging, agreeing, asking, and anticipating. And that's what this publican did. He realized that uh, his sin and his need for forgiveness and his need for mercy, that word uh, mercy there when he said be merciful unto me that word actually means to be propitiated or to be shown kindness and mercy and grace and forgiveness of sin the publican was pleading with God he, he admitted his sin he, he acknowledged that he couldn't meet that sin and he agreed that God could meet it so he's asking God to forgive him and look for, at verse number 14 Jesus says I tell you this man, the publican, went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone, must, uh, for everyone that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. The publican went home justified. How did the Pharisee go home? The same way he came. I think that's the problem with a lot of believers today. You know, we come before the Lord, whether it be in church, in worship, or we come before the Lord in prayer, at home, or wherever it may be, and we leave the same way we came. Unrighteous in the sight of God. See, there was an examination that went on. There was an evaluation. And Jesus evaluated the heart of each of these two men. One man's heart was full of pride, and the other willingly humbled himself before God. 1 Peter 5.5 5 tells us, God resisteth the proud, 
but giveth grace to the humble. If you'd like to turn to Daniel 4, Daniel 4, and I want to tell you a little bit about a man that, that dealt with, with this problem of pride and the consequences that came along with pride. His name was King Nebuchadnezzar. And Daniel 4 tells us that, that pride actually prevented Nebuchadnezzar from ruling the Babylonian Empire for a period of seven years. You know, if you remember, if you've read this, uh, you see that Nebuchadnezzar, he had this, this dream, this vision of this great tree that was just filled with, with fruit and, and birds on the limbs, and it provided shade over all the beasts. And then in his vision, he saw that the Lord had, had cut that tree down all the way to his roots. And it bothered him, and, and he, he was trying to get the interpretation. Eventually, Daniel interpreted this dream for him and said, that tree is you. It's, that's a, a sign of you, a symbol of you, Nebuchadnezzar. God is going to cut you down in your pride. Verse number 30, Daniel 4, verse 30, the king spake and said, is not this? Look at the problem he had with pride. Look at this, the, the problem that Nebuchadnezzar had in verse number 30. The king spake and said, is not this great Babylon? that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? See, he had a problem with pride. And God brought him low to the point where he was actually as a beast in the field for seven years. And eventually, Nebuchadnezzar came to recognize during that time that God is indeed the ruler of the world. He repented of his sins God restored him to a right frame of mind, and he actually, after seven years, he had his kingdom restored unto him. Verse number 34, Daniel 4, 34. And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, now look at the change in the attitude from verse 30 to verse 34. I lifted up mine eyes into heaven, and my understanding returned unto me. And I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion. And his kingdom is is from generation to generation. See, Nebuchadnezzar no longer focused on himself. His attention, his appraise, his praise was, was directed to the Most High God. Look at verse number 37. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, <laughs> I praise and extol the honor of the King of Heavens, all whose works are truth, and his ways judgment. Now look at the last part of verse 37. And those that walk in pride... He's able, let me tell you from personal experience, he's able to abase. He's able to bring you down. And that's what, you see, he learned the consequences of pride. And he came with a spirit of humility. Pride in Nebuchadnezzar eventually turned to humility, and that humility eventually turned to surrender to God. Proverbs 16, 18 tells us that pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Turn, if you would, to 2 Chronicles 7. 2 Chronicles chapter 7. <clears throat> this is one of the more familiar verses in the Bible. And as, as I was reading this, I, I couldn't really, I, I couldn't but help but think about America today. And I know you hear this, this verse many times whenever we speak messages on our country and the need for prayer. But listen uh, to this. That, let, me, let me tell you a little bit about this. When it, it, it dealing about the issue of humility and prayer. And, and the scenario here is in, in the year 960 B.C., Solomon, he, he had just finished, he had completed the temple, he had dedicated to the Lord. And, and then afterwards, the Lord came to Solomon in, in a vision by night, and he spoke to Solomon, and he gave Solomon a warning and a promise. Beginning in verse number 12, 2 Chronicles 7, verse 12. And the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said unto him, I have heard thy prayer and have chosen this place to myself for an house of sacrifice. Now look at the crisis he talks about in verse 13. If I shut up heaven that there be no rain, or if I command the locusts to devour the land, or if I send pestilence among my people, if my people, which are called by name, by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. See, 
God promises that whenever crisis comes into our life, if the people will humble themselves, then he'll hear their prayers. And and the the implication here is if we'll humble ourselves, God will hear our prayers. But if we don't humble ourselves, God won't hear our prayers. I wonder if that's the problem with America today. You see, he wants us to humble ourselves. Don't come with a a, a blame somebody else attitude or an unsurrendered heart because God's not going to listen. He wants us to come with a a humble heart. People must first humble themselves and and then pray and then seek his face and and turn from their wicked ways. And, And each one of these conditions is significant. Humility admits that there's a need. Prayer voices that need, and seeking his face means calling upon him to turn back. The the fact that we're seeking his face assumes, we're seeking his face assumes that he's turned his face from us in judgment. And we need to, we need to, uh, instead of, instead of him shining his face upon us in blessings, he's actually turned his face from us in judgment. And so we need to seek his face. We have to turn from our wickedness. We need to repent and ask God. And we can't do that unless we come with a humble spirit and a spirit of humility. Turn to Isaiah. Last last place to turn. Isaiah 37. And we're going to wrap it up. This might be one of the best displays of both humility and pride in the Bible. And it's seen in the a series of events in the life of, of Hezekiah. In the year 701 BC, there was this, this proud king of Assyria by the name of Sennacherib. And Sennacherib, he had invaded Judah and he was conquering all these people. And uh, he eventually he was coming upon upon Jerusalem, outside of Jerusalem, and he sent this band of, of soldiers along with a spokesperson in with a threatening message to the people of Judah and to humiliate King Hezekiah. Now, this was an army from Syria, but yet they came speaking in the Hebrew tongue. They wanted all the people to hear what Sennacherib had to say. And they talk about all the, the, the conquests they had made, how they had overrun all these these people that had tried to resist them, and he's saying, don't even try to resist us, because we're coming in. And they wanted to humiliate. Don't trust in Hezekiah or his God, because it didn't work for the other folks, and it's not going to work for you. And, and Hezekiah actually, so he had some of his uh, servants go and try to talk to him. He says, wait, we understand Syrian. Speak to us in the Syrian language so that our people don't hear this. And they didn't. They wanted everybody to hear the threatening message of Sennacherib. And upon hearing the threats... It actually starts in chapter 36, but we're only going to look here at verse 37. Upon, I mean, uh, chapter 36, but we're only going to look at 37. Upon hearing the threats, Hezekiah, he tore his clothes in an expression of grief and humility, and he went to the temple to pray, to, to seek the Lord. And, uh, and then he, he sent his officials to, to go find Isaiah, the prophet of Isaiah, and ask Isaiah to pray on, on their behalf. He admitted that he couldn't do it on his own. He admitted that he had a need, and he acknowledged that he had no way of meeting that need, and he agreed that only the God of Isaiah, the God uh, of Israel, could, could meet that need. And so he's asking for prayer. He's asking Isaiah to pray along with us too. Look at verse uh, 6 and 7 of chapter 37. And Isaiah said unto him, Thus shall, and this is God's answer through Isaiah, Thus shall ye say unto your master, Thus saith the Lord, Be not afraid of the words that thou hast heard, whether, uh, wherewith the servants of the king of Assyria hath blasphemed me. And I love this next part. Verse 7. Behold, <laughs> I will send a blast upon him. Boy, I'm waiting for that to happen today. Send a blast upon those that, that blaspheme God. Meanwhile, King Sennacherib, he heard that Hezekiah had refused to surrender. And so he he sent his soldiers back with a written letter, a final warning in writing. And what did Hezekiah do? 
Hezekiah took the letter and he went into the temple again and he spread the letter out before the Lord and he began to pray in humility and in, in, in the spirit of humbleness and just praying and admitting, God, I can't do this. God, there's, uh, we have a need and, and I can't, there's nothing I can do. I know you can do something here. And he's asking God to take this. And God honored and rescued Hezekiah and the people of Jerusalem. Why did God do this? According to verse 21, he did it because Hezekiah prayed to him. Hezekiah admitted the need. God struck down and killed 185,000 of the Assyrian soldiers in the camp the next day. Sennacherib, he went back to Assyria with his tail tucked between his legs as a defeated warrior. When he got home, he had his two sons waiting for him with swords, and they killed him. A difference between humility and pride is seen in the lives of Hezekiah and Sennacherib. Proverbs 22, 4 links humility with the fear of the Lord. In verse, uh, it says, by humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Humility and prayer gives life. Proverbs 15, 33 says, the fear of the Lord is the instruction of wisdom and before honor, before honor is humility. I learned a long time, they say, what is, you know, uh, humbleness, I've heard people think, well, that's just, that's just weakness. Humility, that's talking about weakness. That's not, that's actually, I learned this definition years ago, not long after I would say, humility and humbleness is actually strength under control. It takes strength to show humility. It takes strength to be humble. So how can we have this humble heart? Well, God doesn't expect us to do it alone. Remember, God gave his son for us so that he could live in us. And the Holy Spirit is there to help us to draw closer to God and depend upon him every day of our life, calling upon the name of the Lord and, and uh, knowing him and loving him more and more. And we need to come before the Lord in a spirit of humility, admitting our need. And agreeing that we can't meet that need and asking God to meet that need and then just waiting for him to answer that. Let me finish with this. We have a choice whenever we, we face a crisis in our life. We can humbly look to the Lord and, and trust God in his word and in his ways or we can proudly look to our own ways and try to answer and try to meet that need in our own wisdom. James 4, 6 through 8. If you want to turn there, you can, but I, I promise you, you didn't have to turn there, so I'll just read it. James 4, 6 through 8, you know this anyway. It says, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace to the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God, and resist the devil and he will flee from you. Then look at verse number 8. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh unto you. I don't have the uh, mic here, so I'm going to, uh, all four of you right here, John, Joanna, Celia, and Candace, can you all come up here just for a minute? i got to uh, get some help with this illustration here. I think this will help. It says, submit yourselves to the Lord, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you. Draw nigh unto God, and he'll draw nigh unto you. Now, John, I'm going to let you be God, okay? Can you be God? All right, come on over here. I'm going to let you be over here. You're God, all right? You just stand right here, all right? Now, when I step towards you, you step towards me. When I step towards each other, when I step towards you. All right? You three right here, you all are the devil. <laughs> Don't they make a good devil? Okay. All right. Now, the Bible says resist the devil. And he'll flee from you. Don't flee. I don't want you to. But draw nigh unto God. Now look at the difference here. Draw nigh unto God and he'll draw nigh to you. Here's where a lot of us are today. We're letting the devil influence us in our lives. The devil's trying to say, oh, you know, 
oh, they, you'd love to have this, or you know, th- you need to be spending more time doing this, or or and it gets us our thoughts and our minds on things that that are not things that the Lord would have. And also, the devil wants us to think about ourselves and not think about about the Lord. So uh, the devil is going to do everything that they can to keep us from drawing nigh unto God. And here's where we're at. God, I, I want to draw closer to you. God, I want to draw closer to you, but I'm listening to the devil. I want to draw closer to you, God, and we stay right here. We're coming to the Lord, and we got this that problem with, with pride and self-centeredness, and we're thinking of ourselves, and we're not getting any closer to God in our lives. We're right where we started from. We, we, we leave, we, we're done with our prayer, amen, and we go back, and we're no closer to God than we were. But God said, well, the Bible says, draw nigh unto God, and he'll draw unto you. So we're here. God, I want to have a closer relationship with you. God, I, I want to be in more fellowship with you. And then when I draw closer, look what's, looks what's, look what's happening here. As I step closer to the Lord and resist the devil, my fellowship with God is becoming closer and closer. Thank you. You all can have a seat. Appreciate it. So the, the key is, is for us to resist the devil, submit ourselves unto God, draw nigh unto God. And you can't do that as long as pride stands in the way. You can't do it on your own. It's going to take a spirit of humility. It's going to take humbleness. Every time we come before God in prayer, wherever you're at, not just in church, anywhere, you need to come with a humble spirit, realizing how undeserving we are To even be able to speak to God and call upon Him and ask Him for His forgiveness and His mercy and His grace. Admitting that we can't meet that need and acknowledging that He can. And uh, and asking Him and then just waiting for Him to meet that need. Father, Lord, we thank You for tonight. Lord, we thank you for the privilege of power and, and, and the, uh, the power in prayer. And Lord, so many times our attitude is wrong. Lord, I know that I'm guilty of, the, of this as well, Father Lord. We come and our attitude and our heart is just not where it needs to be when we come before you in, in prayer. Father Lord, help us in those areas. Help us, Father Lord, to realize the importance of humility. Help us to realize, God, Lord, that you'll bless humbleness, but Lord, you're going to resist. Lord, you won't even hear our prayers when we come with a prideful spirit. So, Father Lord, as we continue in this study of prayer, Father Lord, I pray that it would change our prayer life. I pray that our prayer life would become more powerful and more effective as we put these things in into practice. Thank you for the many uh, displays and examples that we saw tonight in your word of the benefits of coming with the right spirit and how you bless that. In Jesus' name we pray.